Major League Baseball is open for business. Players endorse products, and ballparks are monuments to modern consumer culture. 100 years ago, the game already had very strong associations with certain consumer goods, from beer and hot dogs to gum and cigarettes. But what does any of this history reveal about the United States? Let's talk about baseball's relationship to advertising and commerce. George Wright, seen here, was probably the first baseball player to endorse a product in 1874. He played the game during the period immediately after the American Civil War in which mass-produced consumer goods were being advertised in growing urban markets across the United States and especially in the northern industrial cities where professional baseball leagues entertained urban dwellers. Cigars were the most profitable manufactured tobacco product at the dawn of professional baseball, but not long after, new industrial machines could chop tobacco, roll cigarettes, and package them mechanically. To promote their new product, cigarette companies issued trading cards of Native American chiefs, boxers, actresses, and baseball players with individual packages of cigarettes. Famously, the Pittsburgh Pirates star, shortstop, and National League batting champion Honus Wagner demanded the American tobacco company withdraw his card from the market, and that scarcity made his trading card subsequently valuable. Now, Wagner did profit from his celebrity. In 1905, he signed a contract to endorse the Louisville Slugger baseball bat, and his signature also appeared on gloves, leather gloves. I don't know what players like George Wright and Honus Wagner got paid for their product endorsements, but it surely would have been a welcome source of income. And as advertising companies began conducting market research, they learned that consumers were impressed by celebrity endorsements. Yes, Americans have been celebrity obsessed for a long time. Wrigley's chewing gum soared in popularity during the early 20th century and remains one of the most recognizable brands in the United States, much like Colgate Toothpaste, which began mass-producing its product in the 1870s and had become an oral hygiene juggernaut by World War I. The point is, baseball players have to brush their teeth too. Why not pitch for a product like Colgate? And especially after chewing all of that tobacco. Let's talk about tobacco for a bit. From the beginning of professional baseball, the game's players chewed tobacco at a higher rate than their American male peers. In fact, a 1999 study showed that 31% of Major League Baseball rookies use smokeless tobacco. Chewing tobacco, unapologetically marketed using Native Americans, was a widespread habit among ballplayers until very recently. Mid-century ballpark vendors sold cigarettes to spectators as they would peanuts or Cracker Jacks, and fans could light up just about anywhere they wanted. Stars such as Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams pitched for Chesterfields. Willie Mays and Jackie Robinson did it too. The day after the New York Yankees won the 1951 World Series, Camel Cigarettes had already prepared an ad featuring the newly crowned champions. Well, the number of adult Americans who smoked peaked mid-century, and cigarette companies possessed a large and lucrative market of nicotine-addicted smokers. By the late 1960s, however, scientific data had demonstrated the health risks associated with smoking, and President Richard Nixon signed legislation banning cigarette ads on TV, a law that went into effect in 1971. Fifteen years later, federal law would ban television advertising of smokeless tobacco products, and by the time Barack Obama became president, Congress banned tobacco companies from sponsoring sporting events, among other new restrictions. Beer is the most popular alcoholic drink in the United States, with a long history and one intertwined with baseball. At the time of the game's professionalization, German immigrants were pouring into Midwestern cities such as St. Louis and Milwaukee, and a good number of these immigrants established factories for the mass production of beer. Breweries across the land signed stars to endorse their products, and here we see two legends, Cap Anson and Buck Ewing, 
enjoying E&J Burke Pale Ale and Stout. In St. Louis, a German immigrant from Prussia named Christian Wanderer purchased the Browns because he understood the economic potential of the ballpark as a place to sell beer and sausages and create a whole entertainment district next to Sportsman's Park with water slides and horse racing. The price of admission to see the game, therefore, was just one source of income. Not everyone in St. Louis liked the booze flowing through Sportsman's Park, and the temperance movement, much older than baseball itself, gathered sufficient momentum to fully ban the sale of alcoholic beverages in 1919. The failed social experiment called Prohibition wiped out the lawful production of beer for more than a decade, and after the repeal of Prohibition in 1933, the brewing industry faced a host of new regulations that favored the biggest producers. By 1980, just a handful of large brewing companies, Anheuser-Busch, Miller, Paps, Schlitz, dominated the national beer market, and they produced pale lagers, not so much noted for their good taste. The quality of beer may have declined, but not its association with the ballpark. Just about every beer company had baseball pitchmen, and because so little distinguished beers at this time, they had roughly the same taste, beer companies competed for customers with clever advertising and the price of the product. Let's talk breakfast cereal. Companies manufacturing the sugared up processed wheat, corn, and rice competed for the affection of children with cartoon characters. And who else? Baseball players. Here you see Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris advertising Bugs Bunny Post Cereal to kids during the early 1960s. Unsurprisingly, athletes have long pitched for Kellogg's, General Mills, and Quaker Oats. What goes on top of breakfast cereal? Milk does. And the dairy industry is one of the largest in North America. Later in the 20th century, baseball players such as Daryl Strawberry and Mark McGuire would sign contracts to advertise milk, while manager Tommy Lasorda pitched for yogurt. Here is a commercial for ice cream, starring Gaylord Perry. Certain snacks, peanuts, Cracker Jacks, candy bars, and soda, have been ballpark staples for over 100 years, as well as the massive market for chewing gum. And like chewing tobacco or sunflower seeds, it remains associated with baseball. Beech Nut and Bazooka gained market share during the 1950s and challenged the behemoth Wrigley. Tops, the same company that owned Bazooka, began issuing packs of baseball trading cards with one stick of gum, a pattern that persisted from the 50s until 1991. Up to this point, I haven't mentioned Babe Ruth, in part because he endorsed everything I've been talking about, from tobacco products to breakfast cereal to candy bars, bats, balls, even underwear. He was a modern superstar in every sense of the word, larger than life, and a recognizable face that could be used to sell anything. By the 1970s, advertising was evolving away from the straightforward approaches of the early 20th century. Print and television commercials made use of irony, humor, and understatement in ads, and recruited athletes to endorse a wider array of products, from hair tonic and antiperspirant to aftershaves, and pain relievers. Reggie Jackson lent his celebrity to Panasonic camcorders, while Coke and Pepsi, the two bottling giants, embraced a new kind of ad influenced by MTV, with its fast-paced editing. And just generally, commercials got slicker and funnier by the end of the century. Another major story is the sheer variety of goods and services advertised in modern sport, from insurance and antacids to Flomax and Viagra. As you can see, the ballpark itself is an incredibly busy site of advertising. What viewers see behind home plate can change with every at-bat, and elsewhere in the stadium, ads are everywhere. The 21st century ballpark uh, takes us to an interesting story because one might assume a progressive trend towards more advertising, not less, but in reality, ballparks had less of it mid-century. Here you see Fenway Park's now iconic left field in 1912. Note the ads for beer, whiskey, and Coca-Cola. Ten years later, 
a similar number of ads, if not the ones for beer or whiskey, appear on the left field wall. 50 years later, the wooden benches are gone and the iconic green monster, as it's called, towers over left field without a single advertisement. During the 1975 World Series, it's striking how little advertising can be seen inside of either of the two stadiums where it took place. With millions watching on television, it's amazing from a contemporary business perspective that owners forfeited such an opportunity to generate revenue. Here you have Ebbets Field in Brooklyn. You see adverts for mundane items such as razor blades, soap, and hats. And then it changed after the move west to Los Angeles. Dodger Stadium opened in 1962 and had relatively little advertising, and it stayed that way for three decades. Here are the Dodgers and Yankees competing in the 1977 World Series. The outfield walls and grandstands, both at Yankee and Dodger stadiums, have yet to be commercialized. And it was like this elsewhere. The Astrodome, the Big A, Three Rivers Stadium. It's as if owners in the 1970s agreed to scrub ads off their outfield walls and jettison all others except for a handful of large signs above the outfield. I didn't devote the time to researching why things changed between the 1950s and 1970s, but the increasing role of advertising at the ballpark is connected to rising fan attendance. During the 1980s, more people came to the ballpark, and it became more profitable to advertise at this entertainment venue. Furthermore, more people than ever could watch the game on television and see inside of the ballpark. The oldest, and one might say the most dignified, ballparks, such as Wrigley Field and Fenway Park, have tried to balance the stadium's traditional look with its use of valuable advertising space. But the difference between then and now is plain. I will conclude this video on baseball's relationship to advertising in the United States with a few remarks. First, the establishment of professional baseball leagues coincided with the advent of commercial capitalism a new kind of consumer culture defined by mass marketing to urban industrial populations. Second, advertisers aim to influence public behavior, but they are also subject to national politics. Producers of tobacco products and alcoholic drinks faced widely varying regulatory environments in the 20th century. Third, baseball became much more profitable for teams and players during the 1980s. Its popularity and ubiquity on television created increased opportunities for everyone involved. Fourth, if you're streaming baseball games using an internet connection, the ads on your screen are almost certainly targeted to your demographic, your search habits, and your recent purchases. And then there is even virtual advertising, in which advertising panels at live sporting events change depending on the city and local market. Mexicans, Americans, and Japanese see different ads while watching the same contest. In this video, I'm sure I left out quite a few memorable player endorsements or ad campaigns. Let me know what I missed in the comments or anything else about the history of advertising. And thanks for watching.